Hello, I'm Harold Chestnut, the facilitator for Citywide PAC Against Crime. I want to thank the PAC facilitators, Constance Stanley, the Director of Neighborhood Improvement Service Department, and her staff for help to organize this community conversation with the Durham Police Department, Sheriff Department, Officers and Durham of the Emergency Community Center. Most important, I want to thank Durham residents for joining us tonight. It will take all of us working together to create a safer Durham. Thank you. Partners Against Crime PAC was birthed through the U.S. Department of Justice Wheat and Seed Strategy in or around 1991. The community leaders in Durham at the time decided to adopt the weed and seed concept as an effort to reduce crime and create viable, safe, and thriving neighborhoods. Some of the same concepts from weed and seed still exist today in PAC. Weeding consists of law enforcement and prosecutors' efforts to weed out criminals who participate in violent crime, drug abuse through enforcement, adjudication, prosecution, and supervision. Seeding brings prevention intervention, treatment, and neighborhood revitalization services to the area. The use of the term community policing, which became a major backbone of the PAC strategy, is a collaborative effort between law enforcement and the community to identify problems of crime and disorder and involve all elements of the community in the search for solutions to these problems. Partners Against Crime also adopted a major strategy from Weed and Seed the Neighborhood Restoration Economic Development element of Wheat and Seed Strategy was designed to revitalize distressed neighborhoods and improve the quality of life in the designated communities through economic development and a revitalization of the community's health and wellness. Neighborhood restoration programs help to improve living conditions, enhance home security, allow for low cost physical improvements, to develop long term efforts to renovate and maintain housing, and provide educational, economic, social, recreational, and other opportunities. Neighborhood restoration can be achieved only through the collaborative effort and the use of federal, state, local, and private sector resources. 30 years later, and the Durham community still face some of the same issues, such as high crime, affordable housing, food insecurities, and racial disparities in education and public health. All district PACs remain committed to working with the community, city and county governmental agencies and departments, local businesses and schools to make Durham a safe, thriving and welcoming place to live. We will now have PAC 2 to introduce themselves. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rebecca Red Jolly and the co-facilitator for PAC 2. Uh, which is located in North Durham. We meet the second Monday each month at 6 p.m. We're doing Zoom edition right now, but we look forward to in-person meetings sometime in 2022. And you can also reach us on Facebook at packspace 2 dash in space Durham at pack 2 Durham. And I will put the information the uh, link in the chat. So if you um, want to have any additional information about PAC2, I'll certainly address that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. Good evening. My name is Mindy Soley, and I am the co-facilitator of PAC3. Our district is the Southwest quadrant of the city of Durham. Currently, we are also meeting virtually the second Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. Our next virtual meeting is Saturday, December 11th. You can contact us at pack3leadershipteam at gmail.com to get on the PAC3 listserv. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello again. Hello again. I'm Harold Chestnut. I'm also the facilitator for Partners Against Crime District 4 and 5. We meet every second said at Campus Hill at 10 o'clock. During the COVID-19, we met uh, virtual the same time every second Saturday. If there's any questions, please give me a call or email me 
I will put my information in the chat room. Thank you. Great evening, everyone. My name is Regina Mays, and I am the former co-facilitator for District 1, Path 1, and I am a resident of East Durham, which that PAC meets every third Saturday of the month, promptly at 10.30 a.m. Um, at Halton Resource Center, located on North Driver Street. And we welcome you in person to join. That is the only way we presently meet. Right now, I will go into the purpose of this conversation this evening, and it is to discuss how to build a stronger and safer community through conversation, because we want to break the stigma that community and law enforcement cannot work together, because we truly can. Tonight, we will provide you with the resources from DPD and the 911 Emergency Communication Center, along with after the presentations. We will end the night with a brief Q&A with the Durham Police Chief Patrice Andrews and Durham Sheriff Clarence Burkhead. At this time, will all presenters please unmute yourself and take your um, turn on your camera so you can introduce yourself and your department. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hinchy. I am a Victim Witness Services Coordinator with the City of Durham Police Department. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sergeant Mark Viskanich, and currently I'm the Acting Lieutenant for our Community Service Division. Good evening. My name is Officer Mock, and I am the Community Resource Officer for District 3 and District 1. Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrice Andrews, and I am the Chief of Police for this great city of Durham. Good evening, everyone. Sheriff Clarence Burkhead, Durham County Sheriff's Office. Thank you all. Now we will jump right into our presentations and each panelist describing briefly what exactly their department do and how can um, the community stay in touch with you. So right now we will have Jennifer Henshi from the Victim Services Department speak first. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Jennifer Henshi and I'm a Victim Witness Services Coordinator with the City of Durham Police Department. Next slide, please. The Victim Witness Services Unit is committed to providing essential services to crime victims and witnesses of crime to ensure that they're treated with respect, compassion, fairness, and dignity. Next slide, please. The Victim Witness Services Unit is governed by the North Carolina's Crime Victims Rights Act. The general statute outlines the responsibilities of law enforcement agencies across the state of North Carolina stating that they must provide crime victims within 72 hours certain um, responsibilities. And those responsibilities include information on medical services, information on crime victims' compensation, contact information for the prosecuting district attorney's office and the local law enforcement agency investigating the crime, and lastly, information about the accused's opportunity for release. Our agency meets the requirements outlined by the general statute, both on scene with our patrol officers and through the efforts of the Victim Witness Services Unit. Next slide, please. This slide shows the Crime Victims Rights Form that our patrol officers provide to victims of crime while on scene of the incident. The first column lists the rights of crime victims to be informed throughout the whole criminal justice response process. In the second column, it provides the required contact information for victims' compensation, the law enforcement agency investigating the crime, the local district attorney's office, and for pretrial release programs. Next slide, please. 
On the back of this form, we have provided local resources to assist victims of crime. To include information on how to obtain a protective order and local information about service providers such as the Durham Crisis Response Center and Alliance Health, which both operate 24 hour support services. It also highlights the unit in which I work as a victim witness services coordinator. Next slide, please. The unit makes contact with victims of violent crime by phone, mail, email, and in person. The services that we provide include providing emotional support to victims and witnesses of crime. Another area where we offer support is filing North Carolina crime victims compensation claims. We have those applications and assist victims and their loved ones to complete that application process, which allows them to possibly receive funding for things like medical services, counseling services, crime scene cleanup, and in the instance there is a loss of life, it could cover funeral expenses as well. We also provide basic case status information and updates and referrals to local resources depending on the needs of the victims. We participate in various multidisciplinary teams to include a domestic violence and sexual assault response teams and also a human trafficking task force. Lastly, each year in the month of April, we participate in National Crime Victims Rights Week programs, bringing events and activities to the local members of our community here in Durham. Next slide, please. We are currently housed in the Community Services Division at the Police Department over on Holloway Street. We have three full-time Victim Witness Services coordinators that work Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30 p.m. If you <clears throat> have any questions or concerns or you have been a victim of a crime, please don't hesitate to reach out and make contact with any of the three of us. Also be on the lookout for information for upcoming events for National Crime Victims Rights Week of 2022. Thank you for your time and attention this evening and I would be happy to take any questions at this time. Next slide, please. Okay, we thank you, Jennifer Henshi, for presenting this evening. And if any questions come about um, as the community think through some things, it is okay to use your chat and we will definitely come back to those um, after the next presenter. Right now, we will have a presentation by Sergeant Vizconich. I'm going to get it right. Um, from the Community Engagement Unit. Good evening, everyone, again. Yes, I am uh, Sergeant Mark Piskanich uh, with the Community Service Division. And as soon, I'll start as soon as the slideshow uh, presents itself. So one of the squads in our division is the Community Engagement Unit. Next slide, please. So what does this community engagement unit do? It aims to address the root causes of crime in areas throughout Durham as a strategy of neighborly visibility, safety education programs, and intervention initiatives. The name community engagement unit says it all. They have to engage in the community. When this happens, they make the neighborhood safer and more secure. So how do we go about doing this? First, we must build trust and strengthen relationships with the residents. Second, identify and address quality of life issues. And third, we develop partnerships with various departments and organizations that address quality of life issues, and this builds the trust and strengthens those relationships. Next slide, please. 
So how do we build trust within these communities? First, we have to get out into the community. As simple as it may seem, sound, we have to go out and talk to the residents. This is community policing at its best. We have to find out their concerns, let them know we are not only there to protect them, but also to help. We do this by walking around in these neighborhoods and get to know each other. We classify these as foot patrols in the police world. This allows residents to become familiar with us. We are not just looking to enforce the law, but help. We also assign officers to different communities to include apartment complexes and DHA properties. Officers will check in with property managers if the community has one to find out ways that the community can help to deter crime as officers cannot be everywhere. So it has to start with each individual community first. As officers continue with community policing, they find out the concerns of the residents, the quality of life issues. These con concerns could be from the recent trends such as violent crime, drugs, gang activity, property crimes, even an abandoned vehicle, which can be an eyesore. Our community engagement is just not about crime, but it is to help the community. They help to remove graffiti off walls. They will get shoes removed off of power lines, which is sometimes a sign of gang activity or drugs could be sold in those areas. To engage with these communities, officers will hold pop-up events, safety seminars, workshops, and community meetings. This is as simple as putting a table out with some giveaways and handing out safety tips. Another way of building trust with the youth is during the summer, we have six weeks of summer camps. Here the youth to get to interact with the officers while they go hiking, fishing, playing sports, race fast RC cars, and learn CPR. The list goes on. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the third way to make neighborhoods safer and secure is by partnering up with different organizations, churches, and groups to help make the city of Durham a better place. We volunteer with many nonprofit organizations to provide, to provide services for the community. Here's a small list of a much larger list of recent partners that we partnered up with. The Durham Bike Co-op. It is an all volunteer nonprofit organization that uses bikes to make communities a better place. They help to repair and give out bicycles. One of our officers has been known if a bike is beyond repair, he will replace it with a new or refurbished one. ICNA Relief of North Carolina. ICNA stands for Islamic Circle of North America. This is also a nonprofit. It provides social services and food distribution. The Zakat Foundation is a Muslim charity and it has partnered with us to help feed low income families. Sleep in Heavenly Peace is another nonprofit organization. They work off donations to supply raw materials to make beds for kids who do not have one to sleep on. Keep Durham Beautiful is another nonprofit organization which works to engage and inspire individuals to take ownership of their environment. And of course, the Durham Fire Department and then the Neighborhood Improvement Services who is hosting this wonderful event so I can get to speak to you. The Community Service Division is a wealth of knowledge of when it comes to resources. As we found out, some of the underlying issues and concerns which might not always be related to crime, and this is where we can coordinate with our partners to better serve the residents. Many times a crime may have occurred, but the root cause may have been mental illness. Instead of taking someone to jail, we could refer to another partner, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Next slide, please. I want to thank all of you for your time and listening to me. We are constantly looking for new ways to engage in the community. So please write down my information or the other supervisors, and I would be more than glad to help you out. At this time, are there any questions? Hi, we have uh, one question from Michael Balin. How does your unit empower the community? Basically by being with them, getting out there, getting to know them. Uh, I will say when I've been out there with them, it's just walking around. I got to, there was one day that I got to just walking around, getting to know people. I sat down on one of the, the edges of the sidewalk and just talking to somebody for about 40 minutes. And at one point in time, this lady, she started to cry with just a conversation that we had. So just getting out there and getting to know the people is by far, but in my opinion, is the best way to empower. 
Great. We also have a question from Robert. Has the CEU efforts been reduced because of the current staffing issues? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I'm scrolling through them. Um, so a question from Michael, but I don't know if we want to kind of postpone this one of how will you connect with the newly formed safety department? I will have to say we'll defer on that one as that one is still being uh, processed at this time. And from a Reverend D, I'm sorry, I cannot see your full name. It was saying, can you announce the churches that you work with in the community for your department specifically? I believe that's what the question is leading to. Well, I want to thank them as well, too, because they're the ones that help us out that we like to coordinate with. And if they would like to coordinate some type of uh, event, please don't hesitate to contact me. Okay, and I will take this second before we move to the next presenter. Thank you, Sergeant Viscanich. <laughs> get it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I do want to just touch on a bit of a clarification because I do understand the news report that went out this morning. I also saw it myself. So being facilitator and being part of the planning for this um, conversation, please let me make it very, very clear. Yes, we will be accepting questions and comments from the community per these departments. But it, I just want to be clear that we are staying specifically to these departments. And that is why this is hosted by the different district PACs in the community. So you can take other concerns that you might have back into your PAC areas because um, these are citywide departments being printed, presented this evening. And when you go into your districts, some of those have, they have their individual districts that they deal with and that they address their crime reports and different things of that nature. So I will be mindful of the questions that um, are being asked and the comments being made. It is not to be disrespectful to anyone on the line. But I do want to make that very clear this evening on the purpose we are here so you can learn about the different citywide departments throughout the Durham Police Department and also have, like we said, some brief Q&A with um, the sheriff and the chief of police. Thank you. Our next presenter will come from Officer Mock from the Community Resource Unit. Good evening. My name is Officer Lawanda Mock, and I'm currently assigned to the Durham Police Department's Community Resource Unit. The Community Resource Unit encourages, educates, and trains Durham residents, businesses, and various demographics to use best practices and strategies to deter crime and minimize opportunities for crime to occur. How does the Community Resource Unit get involved with residents with our residential programs? Our home security assessment is a free service to residents and burglary victims. Our light assessment is a free service to residents as well. We assess lighting in the communities and we work closely with the City of Durham Transportation Office. The speed trailer, next slide, sorry. The speed trailer is a device that shows a digital display of a motorist's speeds as they drive by. The goal is to slow down speeders. Next slide, please. How does this community resource unit get involved with businesses? With our business programs, crime prevention through environmental design is the proper design and effective use of a built environment that can lead to a reduction in fear and incidents of crime, and it improves the quality of life. The four principles of SEPTED includes natural surveillance, natural access control, territorial reinforcement, and maintenance. We also offer robbery prevention training and workplace violence training. The Community Resource Unit hosts an annual business workshop. The picture you see to the right of your screen is from our 2019 business workshop. We attend 
business, the Durham Business Against Crime monthly meetings and share this program with the businesses that we make contact with in the field. Next slide, please. How does the Durham, I mean, excuse me, how does the Community Resource Unit get involved with the youth, with our youth programs? We offer a Stranger Danger program with a presentation. We offer a bike safety and bike rodeo. You can look at the picture to the right of your screen. And this is from our September bike rodeo at the Walltown Park. We collaborated with our community engagement unit and Durham Parks and Recreation. We also offer Kids ID and we have a Treats in the Fleet, which is our Halloween holiday safety event, which is held annually at the Walmart on Glen School Road. Next slide, please. How does the Community Resource Unit get involved, excuse me, with the community? With safety meetings, presentations upon request. We attend community events. We also set up informational tables and pop-ups. We offer a community police academy, which is our premier program for those wanting to know more about the operations of the Durham Police Department. As this is feasible during the year, either virtual or in-person academies may be offered. We held three virtual classes since the pandemic. October is our crime prevention month and we provide residents with safety tips prior to the holiday season. Be on the lookout for our upcoming holiday safety tips. I would like to take this opportunity to tell everyone listening to secure and remove valuables from their vehicles. Don't leave spare keys and never leave a weapon unsecured in a vehicle or a home. Next slide, please. How does the community get the resources it needs? Easy, contact the community resource unit directly. The community resource officers will contact victims in person by phone, email, and mail. Through our safety literature, resources, and recommendations. The picture to the right is of our park smart signage. Residents can also submit a community service bureau request which is an online form to register their events and meetings. We attend monthly PAC meetings, which is Partners Against Crime, to help address community needs and direct residents to the appropriate district commanders, other units, and resources. Next slide, please. The Community Resource Unit is located at District 1 substation. The address is 921 Holloway Street. Next slide, please. Feel free to contact the Community Resource Unit to learn more about our programs and resources. And thank you for listening. And next slide, please. Now time for questions. Thank you very much, Officer Mark, for your presentation. We will now move on to Elizabeth Poole with the Emergency Communication Center, better known as 911. Hey, everybody. Um, I think I was actually skipped in introductions, and that is okay. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Poole, and I'm the Education and Training Coordinator here at Durham 911. So. I'm going to be talking to you briefly just a little bit about us at 911. Um, for those who know me out there, especially with the police department and some of you out there in the community, if you've ever heard me speak, um, it may be a challenge for me uh, to speak in such a small amount of time. But I want to go ahead and offer up front that if you have any um, events that you would like for me to come out and speak to, any churches, any HOA, any neighborhood events, um, community uh, groups, I would be just delighted to come out and talk to y'all and give you all the time that you need to ask all the questions. Um, so there's a lot of things we won't have time to cover, but I just want to let you know you can reach out and contact our agency and I definitely will come out and be glad to speak to y'all further. So um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please.
So what do we do at 911? We actually answer all of the 911 calls for the city and the county of Durham. And we dispatch all Durham City Police, um, all Durham County uh, EMS and city and county fire departments. We don't dispatch Durham County uh, Sheriff's Department. They have their own communication center, but we work very closely with them. So uh, if we get calls that are in the county, we can transfer the callers right, straight over to the Sheriff's Department and they can take over from there. Um, we provide life-saving instructions for those in need. Next slide. So what should you do when you call 911? You need to be prepared to tell us what is the location of your emergency. So you need to remember and keep in mind that when we're on the phone with you, we didn't see what you saw and didn't experience uh, what happened. So we're gonna ask you, what is the location of the emergency? So you need to be prepared to tell us an address, a block range of that street, an intersection, where on the highway are you? You need to be aware of your surroundings at all times. Um, and you wanna be able to tell us the telephone number you're calling from. So in case we get disconnected, we can call you back. Um, and then we wanna know uh, what is the nature of the emergency? Tell me exactly what happened because I don't know, I wasn't there. So it's important that you listen to our questions um, and be able to give us the information that we need so we know how to proceed with your emergency with your call. Next slide. So we have protocols that we use. Um, our employees have extensive um, uh, training uh, that teaches us, teaches us all how to ask the same questions in the same order, the same way to get the correct results. And our protocols standardize uh, the call taking process. So we're going to ask you, uh, you know, again, where's the emergency? What happened? We need to know information if it's a police call, the time of occurrence. We need to know if it's medical, is the person breathing? Are they conscious? Are they alert? Um, what's on fire? We're going to ask you a lot of questions. And then based on what you tell us, we know how to process the call and what helps to get on the way. But we also can provide life-saving instructions over the phone. So we can tell you how to do the helmet maneuver. We can tell you how uh, to stop the bleeding, talk someone through CPR. So even though we aren't the ones who are physically responding, we are responding to you verbally and providing certain instructions that can help save a life over the phone while units are en route. Next slide. So, it's really important to know that if you call 911, do not hang up. Even if you call us and it's an emergency, I'm sorry, it's not an emergency, don't hang up, stay on the line and let us know what's going on. Now, um, also, um, you need to be aware that you can text to 911. We cannot initiate a text from our end, but we can receive a text to 911. So this is something that you would want to use in a situation where making a voice call would just not be safe. If somebody's been kidnapped and they don't want to let the suspect know that they're reaching out to us and they still have their phone, they can text us to 911. And it's important though, the same thing that you can still tell us where do you need help. Next slide. So again, we are not the ones physically responding. So we are communicating with police, fire and EMS um, over the computer and over the radio. So while we are talking to you, um, help is not being delayed. Generally, what causes a delay is when a caller wants to argue and ask, why are you asking me so many questions? Just send them. Um, we have to ask certain questions so we know who we're sending. So it's important that um, you, you work with us um, and you let us know what's going on so we can type everything in the computer system that we use and we can dispatch our units. And then as you answer our questions, we're able to update those units on the way with what exactly is happening. And it's important also that we keep our callers safety in mind as well as our field units safety in mind. So if there's a dangerous situation, we're not necessarily um, going to have those units go right in like if, if it's EMS or fire, they will have to what we call stage and stand by until police can get there and secure a scene because think about this. What good is it going to do if you send your medical help or your fire help into a situation and then they become victims and now your help are victims. And we're kind of going backwards really fast. So scene safety is very important for our callers and our responders. Next slide. Children in 911. I bet if I asked every one of you, how many times have you let a child or grandchild play with your phone? You probably all would kind of laugh and raise your hand. We get a lot of calls from kids playing on the phone. 
Um, it's important to teach your children how to use 911 and when to use 911. So we really encourage you having conversations with, uh, with your kids and kids in the community about the importance of 911. But please make sure that you are not handing over cell phones for kids to play with because they always figure out how to call 911. And then we're kind of sometimes chasing um, what tend to be false calls or kids, again, just playing on the phone. But we don't know that something's not really wrong and maybe grandma can't speak and the child was trying to get help. But it's important um, to talk with children about 911. And believe it or not, kids can be some of the best 911 callers because they don't always understand the severity of the situation. And they will actually tell you the truth as to what's going on. But just teach them about not playing on the phone. That's really important for them to know um, as well. Next slide. So some quick tips for calling 911. Again, do your best to stay calm. And please understand that, you know, we are professionals. We have an extensive amount of training and we know what questions that we need to ask. Um, even though you may think the question's not relevant, I promise you it is relevant. Um, again, know your surroundings, know the location of your emergency. I still tell people today, put your address on your refrigerator, somewhere in your house that when you're teaching those kids about calling 911, that they know where to find the address because you will be surprised. You can live somewhere for 30 and 40 years and you have that one emergency, you'll forget your address. Um, and, and think about you, the community, you're our eyes and ears, and we count on you telling us and describing, uh, telling us what's going on, describing the situation, kind of painting the picture for us. And then we have to in turn paint the picture for our responders. So we are a team in that moment on the phone. And again, post your address, make sure your address um, also is visible for the responders. Don't assume that everybody knows where you live. So I encourage you to think um, about what do you have posted outside? Are your street numbers visible on your mailbox or on your door? That's something you really should look into and make sure that those numbers are very visible. Next slide. Want to give you some non-emergency information. If you need to reach the 911 center on a non-emergency line, that number is 919-560-4600. And you can call us if you have like general questions, something that has nothing to do with any, any immediate emergency. There's no threat to um, a person or property. So you're fine to call that number. Just know that it still rings into the 911 center and we are gonna take the 911 calls uh, first over the non-emergency lines. But if you wanna reach our administrative offices, um, that number is 919-560-4500. And that's the number you can call if you want to get me to come out and talk to your community groups. Um, but if you have any other questions and you want to talk to our director, we welcome your questions. And you can call the 4500 number to reach our administrative offices. Monday through Friday, we're generally, I believe, 830 to 430 or 8 to 430. Next slide. So does anybody have any questions for me? the first time I haven't had questions. That's Jesse okay. Me too. <laughs> That's now. okay because I hope y'all are going to reach out and have me come talk to y'all and we can talk and y'all can ask all the questions you want to. It's okay. So I know we have limited time, but thank y'all so much. I appreciate y'all asking me to be a part of this. Our department really, um, really does appreciate that. And we thank you for being here. Absolutely. So now we will um, prepare ourselves and we do have a, a few pre-submitted questions from the community um, that went through some PAC facilitators. Um, and Mindy, I, I don't know if you're asking that from all the panelists as a whole, or if you're just um, referring to 911, but uh, the question is, are you understaffed? Oh. For 911, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, let me see if I can just see here. So can y'all hear me still? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, we are, we have actually, I'm so excited, y'all. We have been doing some aggressive recruiting and we actually are on our fifth 
uh, training academy for the year, and we're already preparing for our first uh, academy for 2022. So we have done amazing recruiting effort, uh, efforts. And um, I will say that just in general, the 911 industry, as a lot of industries, have struggled with staffing issues. So not unique to 911, but we are really going in an amazing direction. So um, now I'm working really hard. All of us here in our department are working hard, getting so many people trained, but we're really excited um, with the applicants and, and, and with these academies that we have going. Um, we are really busy. So we hope here uh, soon we will be fully staffed. And, and so again, very exciting times for us. And if you could just mention briefly um, how someone can apply. Sure, um, with any job for the city, um, you can always go to the city of Durham's website, durhamnc.gov, and you can go and look for all the job openings under city jobs. So you can see all the positions. So it's not unique just to the police department or 911, but everything that the city is hiring for. So, and I will tell y'all, I have to throw this plug in y'all. I'm an East Durham girl. I've been in Durham all my life. I've been here at 911 for 26 and a half years. So I love the city of Durham. I have grown up here. So please go check out and see what jobs the city's hiring for. We would love to have you come be a part of our family. So just want okay. to throw that in there because I'm all about Durham. So <laughs> we will welcome okay. you aboard. We do have a um, question of why do you require candidates who have a driver's license for employment for 911? So um, we have a lot of certifications that we have to uh, get in security clearance. And so there are a lot of requirements that are set um, for other standards or other, um, other certifications. So that's where that becomes relevant. Um, so a lot of the things that we have in place for applicants are requirements for other things you have to obtain to be able to um, work it with us. And I do want to mention that Laura has put um, the link to the City Jobs Careers in the chat. So you can always click on that or um, copy paste from the chat. But also a question uh, for you, Elizabeth, is about the current response time and how is it trending? I'm not sure what perspective that is, that is um, being asked from, but I will tell you, it's interesting, I was just talking to some of our new hires today and, and talking about how we are very fortunate in Durham that we have amazing response times. Um, for an example, a lot of times for us when we're actually on the phone with our callers that uh, we could be taking a call where somebody's not breathing and we're talking to somebody through CPR and we're in the middle of those instructions and our first responders from the fire department are there, the police department are there and EMS is already pulling up. And I've done a lot of um, speaking at number one events, conferences and things across the United States. And it's very um, interesting to talk to other parts of the country where they have very rural areas where they have very lengthy response times. So I understand that and see how fortunate we are in Durham that we have amazing response times for all of our units. Um, so again, it goes back to like I was saying, that while we're on the phone and we're taking the call and processing the call, while I'm talking to you on the phone, my partner beside me is sending the help. And so we're in constant communication as to what's happening. So the units are getting all the updated information as I'm asking the caller certain questions, they're telling me the answers. I'm, we're letting the field units know, so they know already what's going on, what they're walking into. So, but our response times are really, we're very fortunate in Durham, they're really good. I'm just gonna let y'all know it's a party going on next to me. So hopefully they're not coming into my sound. Um, but the next question is, is there a percentage or can you um, speak on any data about um, unanswered calls? So actually in this form, I'm not gonna go in that direction um, because I'm coming on as a training coordinator and, and um, I don't have any of those stats in front of me, but that is something that you can reach out to our director, Mr. Randy Beeman and ask um, whatever questions regarding those types of stats and he'll be glad to get you that information. And thank you, I'm so glad y'all asked questions. Thank y'all so much, I'm excited. 911 is a hot topic right now. Yes, yes. <laughs> Not to undermine any other department. Yes. And so actually this uh, question, I'm gonna kind of make um, to all panelists 
um, because I'm going to double it up if it's okay. Are there any volunteer opportunities? And also, can we address some of the um, major issues at the current time within the city? Um, because we have a lot of services, but they are not reaching the community in effective ways. If you don't mind, I'll just go ahead and say, since I'm still on, then I'll, I'll be quiet. That for 911, we don't offer any volunteer um, opportunities just because um, of certain access that we have. We're in a secure uh, unit, secured floor. We're not open to the public. And there's a lot of security clearance that employees even have to get just coming in the door before they even get hired. So it's kind of challenging for us to do volunteer opportunities for those um, reasons. So and I'm done. Would any other um, department like to address any of those? Please come off the camera. I mean, I'm sorry. Please turn your camera on. <laughs> come we on. knew what you meant. So <laughs> I, I would say for on the uh, behalf of the police department, right now COVID has, um, has, has um, slowed us down on that um, as far as any volunteer or internship opportunities. We're hoping to, to kind of start that back again because that is a, tremendous um, part of our um, recruiting as well. Thank you, Chief. Um, I'm looking at you all. Okay. How can we have stats on response times, but no, um, not on unanswered calls, Alyssa? Again, please reach out to our department with the non-emergency number um, and reach out to our director. You can get those uh, more specific stats. I just happened to have a conversation earlier about the other stats I was talking about. So um, that's something I was already speaking on today. So, but definitely reach out to our director, 560-4500, Mr. Randy Beeman. Okay, and then uh, um, we're going to take this last one up. When, uh, not having a driver's license prevent someone from applying. Um, I don't know if you can kind of clarify that a little bit, um, Jackie, or. Uh, so again, um, there's certain requirements for certifications and uh, things that processes for certain employees that have to um, happen. Um, even like with getting fingerprinted, we require, we're required to have fingerprints done. You have to show um, your North Carolina driver's license uh, for that. So that's just one thing we have to show in getting fingerprints. So um, there are certain certifications and certain security clearances that um, we end up going through for this position. So for some things, it could be that there's a standard that, um, that is required that we have to meet. Um, so that much, I mean, I can provide at this point in time. So th that is the set answer right now, maybe not the likable answer, but the set answer is basically, yes, you do have to have a license to apply for the 911 position. Okay. At this present time, and, you, and please continue to um, send your questions in through the chat um, in the Q&A bar, but we will move into some of the pre-submitted questions um, that we did gather as facilitators throughout the community. And this will be addressed directly to Chief Andrews and Sheriff Burkhead. And again, please continue to utilize the chat. If we are unable to address your direct question this evening, we will have PAC facilitators address those um, questions and concerns because we will be ending promptly at 7.30 this evening. So I want to say that ahead of time. Um, one of the pre-submitted questions was, how can residents support law enforcement in decreasing gun violence in our city? So I'll, I'll take that. Um, so first of all, thank you for, for um, having me on. Um, so I, I would say this, you know, decreasing gun violence is a, is a partnership. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad to hear that question. So obviously we want to make sure that 
you know, residents are reporting things that they see and obviously things that they know. Um, we do have several components in which to do that anonymously. Um, you know, also keeping in mind that, you know, criminal activity and criminals go where they are kind of allowed to be, right? Um, and so it's important that the, that the residents uh, send a message that, that the criminal activity is not going to be permitted or allowed um, with, within our communities of Durham. Um, unfortunately, we do have an element, um, and it's not all of the, the neighborhoods, right? There are select people that are coming into the community um, that are wanting to, to do harm and commit violent acts, and that's why we need to get them out, and we need your help. Right. And it's and it's it's events like this that serve help to serve as a conduit for that conversation and that discussion and also making sure that our our residents and community as at a, at a, as a whole um, feel comfortable um, coming forward. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the conversation, uh, Regina, and thank you for moderating this. Uh, you all have heard me say this before, this is going to take a community effort to address the gun violence that we're experiencing in Durham uh, and across Durham County. Uh, and, and we at the Durham County Sheriff's Office are constantly engaging in our communities uh, all across Durham County. But 85% of what we do at the Sheriff's Office takes place inside the city limits. Uh, so when we talk about gun violence and I'm you know, addressing it, it it impacts all of us, whether we live in the county or live in the city. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy to say that the Durham County Sheriff's Office and the Police Department has a longstanding history of collaboration and cooperation. And we just must continue to share our resources and continue to share our intel and continue to reach out jointly to the community so we can build those relationships, be, rebuild that trust so the community feels comfortable talking with us. We held a peace rally on Saturday uh, where uh, I and some, some residents, some citizens of Durham met with rival gang members who actually, they actually called the meeting because they too are tired of the gun violence. So that's the type of outreach we have to continue to develop and hopefully working with uh, those who are criminal justice involved or who are in, in gangs working with us to address it because uh, they too are tired of seeing the senseless killings that are occurring day in and day out throughout our city. Thank you. Thank you both for that. Um, another pre-submitted question was, how are most guns being brought into the city and how can residents help to decrease this? Um, so, you know, what we know is this, is that, um, and I had, and I had staff pull some, just some statistics on guns just in general, but we are seeing an increase uh, in the number of guns being stolen um, overall. And obviously we know that that means that there are illegal guns out there, guns that are gained uh, by, by um, you know, car break-ins, for example, guns that are left unsecured in cars. Um, that actually has made up about uh, just over 50% 50, 50 um, of the, the, the guns that we are seeing um, being brought into the city or being used in crimes. And so when we start talking about the, the problem of what's being the guns and what's being brought into the city, we do have to kind of look at certain behaviors, right? Um, and this is where the community can be much more aware of securing their firearms, right? Making sure that they're taking their firearms out of their cars, because understand that that criminal is looking for that gun specifically, right? We've had instances where they leave everything else but get that gun because there is going to be the intention of using it in the commission um, of most likely a violent crime. Um, and so we are seeing an increase. It is up from last year. Um, we've had about 297 guns stolen and that's a 5% increase from, uh, from this time last year. And 53% were from motor vehicles. Um, guns 
uh, you know, we used to be able to um, seize guns on traffic stops. Criminals are getting a little bit smarter, right? And so um, we have to be more strategic in, in how we are identifying where those guns are coming from and where they are at this point. Thank you. There are, there are a number of ways that weapons come into our city. Uh, there is a, a very strong black market. We know that. Uh, we work with ATF, DEA. Uh, both of our agencies have uh, officers assigned the task force. Uh, and we know that, unfortunately, Durham uh, is sort of a hotbed for gun distribution up and down the eastern seaboard. If you think about it, we're, we're positioned right between DC, New York, uh, Baltimore, and then down to uh, Atlanta and Florida, uh, and all points between. So we know that weapons come in and out of our city on a regular basis, and we know how easy it is for young men and women to get access to weapons. Uh, but I am happy to say that we're working with our local state and federal partners, and we are doing everything that we possibly can do to uh, slow the proliferation of weapons in our city uh, and confiscate as many as we possibly can. As the chief mentioned, a lot of the weapons that we're seeing uh, here lately are being stolen. So you've heard me say before, we have to push for responsible gun ownership. If you're going to be a gun owner and you're going to, you know, spout your second amendment right, then be responsible with it. Secure that weapon in the house, secure it in a safe, do not leave it unlocked in your vehicle because it's a hot commodity and we're, we're seeing guns. We're also seeing ghost guns, which are weapons that are being manufactured by individuals, either from a kit or buying a piece here and there. Uh, we've confiscated ghost guns here at the uh, Durham County Sheriff's Office this year. And that is a very alarming because we cannot trace those weapons and they're easy to make and, and they are just as deadly. So we have to be smart if we're going to own weapons uh, and we have to have sensible gun legislation to control who has access to those weapons. Thank you. So if it's okay with the both of you, I'm gonna kind of rotate between the chat box, Q&A and pre-submitted just to make sure I try to get everything covered. Um, we have a question from the chat saying, what role do you think that Durham's legacy of urban renewal has played in creating these conditions and how do we correct them, these historical wrongs? Hmm. So I, you know, I don't know that that's a question necessarily that can be addressed with just solely law enforcement. You know, I think that this is a, you know, when we start talking about, um, and, and some of you might have heard me say that um, when we talk about crime and criminality, um, you know, crime is the leaves of the tree, right? Um, the, the root is what causes that crime. And in order for us to address the crime, we do have to go back and look at what are the causes of crime. Um, and so I think that would be a question that, quite frankly, I don't have the, the expertise to be able, able to answer from a law enforcement perspective. I would agree with uh, Chief Andrews. That's a, it's a broad answer. Uh, it's, a, it's a question that needs a broad answer, uh, but make no mistake, we all, we all know that uh, with progress, we, we as city leaders and, and our city council, county commissioners have to be strategic in addressing uh, those issues and create a Durham that is for everyone, uh, that no community is disenfranchised, but uh, it, it it will take a much broader conversation and perhaps in a, in a, in a different form. Thank you. And I would like to take a moment um, to say thank you to city manager Wanda Page, who has also hopped on. Don't wanna disregard anyone um, that definitely plays an important role throughout our city. So thank you for joining us. 
Um, question number three, what can we do to properly secure our guns? Well, I would suggest uh, investing in a safe. Uh, and if you have the concealed carry, you know, of course, you got to take the class and learn about gun safety in the home and on your person. Uh, I'm a gun owner, obviously, uh, not just for my profession, but uh, as an avid hunter, uh, I keep guns, but I have a safe and that safe stays secure. Uh, Early in my career, I had kids at home. So you wanna always make sure you keep those weapons out of reach, unloaded, gun locks. We distribute those here at the Durham County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we're happy to come out and distribute gun locks in your community or at your PAC meeting, uh, but it really is all about keeping that weapon safe and out of the reach uh, of our young people uh, and certainly out of the hands of those uh, who should not possess a weapon. So safe gun locks is always the way to go. Okay, on to the next. Have we considered a buyback program? So that's um, one of the things that um, we are looking at. Um, in my prior agency, um, we actually did have a gun buyback um, program, and um, and so we are we are looking at doing that here. It's been some years since we've done that in the city of Durham. I think it was I was probably at the early part of my career originally when I was here. So um, that certainly that's something we are we are looking at. Thank you. And what would happen or what happened to Project Safe Neighborhood? So, um, oh, I'm sorry, Sheriff, no, you go. <laughs> so, all right, so um, we, um, our coordinator um, retired in 2018. Um, she was doing our Project Safe, Safe Neighborhood. So um, while we don't necessarily, um, we don't, we don't have project safe neighborhoods formally uh, any longer. We we do um, you know provide and offer um, some resources that are aligned with with the premise of project safe neighborhoods. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Uh, and the chief may not be aware of some recent conversations that uh, we've had with uh, our our federal partners and, and our neighboring uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, we are strongly considering uh, relaunching the Project Safe Neighborhood. Uh, we had great conversations with our AUSA. Uh, as I've said, other agencies that are neighboring to us, Alamance County, Orange County, Wake County, Vance County, and just, just to name a few, uh, because we know it's gonna take a regional approach. Uh, and some of the conversations that we've had about the violence in Durham certainly points to an opportunity for us to, to uh, reinvigorate or reinstitute a project safe neighborhood. So those, those conversations are ongoing, so stay tuned. Thank you. And Sheriff, if you could just kind of tap into um, as those updates come that are being made public, how can the community be aware of them? Um, which updates? All right. As, as those broader conversations are being held, we know that, you know, there are conversations that just need to stay at the table for the moment, but as yeah. they kind of come down the channel, is there like a public way? Sure. To to know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right now, it, it is certainly in its infancy with conversation. And uh, if it, Chief Andrews will remember when we did this back in the, the 90s, we will hold a press conference. We will inform the community that we're launching this initiative. We will certainly invite our, our community stakeholders and organizations because again, the design of the program is to have resources available on the front end and, and you know the penalties on the back end so we can treat 
this from a more holistic approach. It's not just about arresting folks. It's about identifying folks and giving them an opportunity to come to the table. But yes, at the appropriate time, we will certainly do a, a press release and a press conference. Absolutely. Thank you for answering that. I don't want everybody hitting your office up and <laughs> saying, this is what you said online. Um, so the next question will um, go into what about what's being done about the gun violence within our schools? I'm sorry, did you say within our schools? Yeah. Well, you know, we have a, we have a very strong SRO program. We've got a, uh, approximately 26 SROs assigned to 13, 14 schools. And we, we wish we had enough SROs to be in all schools, particularly our elementary schools. We're in all of our high schools right now. And it's been a rocky start to the school year. Now we're approaching the midpoint. Uh, but we have a great relationship with Dr. Mabenga and all of the principals and, and teachers and, and staff and, and a lot of students as well, uh, that we're really making some inroads. As you, you may recall, certainly folks who are listening, that we had some, some pretty knockdown drag out fights earlier in our school year. Uh, I can tell you that we've had 76 fights. I happen to have those numbers here. We have 76 fights. Uh, we've had... Uh, 68 calls for EMS to assist, uh, 44 disturbances or assaults, and we've had 28 drug complaints. Uh, we've confiscated 17 weapons. Uh, so we've been very active this year. And some of those cases that I've just mentioned here, those numbers resulted in uh, juvenile petitions that were referred. Some of them were, were validated and, and moved on through the juvenile system. But we do a lot of referrals. We try to reach our kids and teach them not to make these, these bad choices. Uh, and certainly we have to address the fights and, and break those up. And, and I can say we, we've done that. But we really try to reach the the young people and give them an opportunity to correct their, their ways. Uh, we're not all about arresting folks. Our, our arrest numbers are uh, way sharply down and decreased from this time last year. Uh, we can throw out the COVID year, but I can tell you we have had over 2,600 encounters and we made 14 arrests. Uh, that's pretty good. Again, we use our referral system, deferred prosecution, teen court, juvenile justice system, our counselors who are on hand, really try to get these kids to, to not make these, these bad choices. Thank you. And thank you for also bringing up the fact that it's not just about gun violence, that it are other safety concerns um, in which your department is doing to try to get that under control and address needs that are um, within our community and our schools. And so the next question is about um, shootings and uh, are they, how can you determine if they're gang related? And also um, what is the police department, um, not the sheriff's office so much addressing about this? So, um, you know, most of the time we're able to pretty quickly determine whether or not the motivation um, for a shooting is related to gang activity or for the furtherance of the gang, whether it's motivated or related. Um, you know, staff are, work pretty hard at that. We do have um, several units within the police department that are focused around um, violent crime, uh, specifically gang activity. And, uh, and so we, we are constantly working with our law enforcement partners to include the sheriff's office, um, to include other agencies in other jurisdictions, right? So we know that, um, that crime knows no boundaries. Um, and, and we're constantly working with them to, to maybe help connect some of the, the shootings that we're having. So generally, if we have a shooting one night and then let's say another municipality has a shooting, you know, we want to make that phone call to find out if they're if they're connected. Not all of our shootings are related uh, to gang violence, right? We do have shootings that are domestic, related to domestic um, violence, 
Um, you know, some shootings are, are, are robberies just gone wrong. Um, so, so not all of them are, uh, but, but the ones that are, we're able to pretty quickly determine um, whether or not that's, that's motivated by the gang. And I'll correct that last question. It was not counseling out the sheriff department, but it was also uh, addressing that question to the sheriff department also. Well, I, I would echo what Chief Andrews has said. Uh, we've been very fortunate that we've had uh, less than 20 shootings in the unincorporated area of the county. Uh, and only, I think the, my number as of earlier this week was two people have been shot, no homicides. Uh, but again, the, the, the violence that we're experiencing inside Durham city limits certainly impacts Durham County residents as well. Uh, and so we're doing all we can to work with one another to address this violence. Uh, but as I said a moment ago, it really is going to take all of us, uh, the community, we need their uh, input. And uh, today we, we had the uh, homicide quilt uh, display. We have a program this morning in front of the courthouse. And those victims who carry that pain with them every day we need members of their communities to come forward. Uh, I always say there are at least two people in our communities who know someone that committed that crime and we need them to come forward because it, it is, uh, it's gonna take all of us to solve this. Thank you. Um, and also another question is, if you all know what areas are having the most violent crimes, why not target those areas and be very present there? Well, some of you may know that I, I actually have created uh, a strike team uh, and that is, that is purely de uh, designed for targeted enforcement. And we will continue to do that. We uh, visibility this week. This week, we have identified three areas uh, that I got information from some of my street sources, and we've increased our visibility in that area. And we've uh, we've seized at least two weapons, uh, over a pound, two pounds of marijuana, some meth. I mean, so it's working. And we do not want to over police our communities and we will not over police our communities. So all of our efforts are designed to be very strategic and trying to identify and apprehend those who are committing these violent crimes. And uh, we will continue to increase visibility. Uh, and we're law enforcement is still largely responsive. So when people call us, we will come. Or if I get information like I got a couple of weeks ago, we will set up on these neighborhoods or these hot spots, as we call them, and we will do this targeted enforcement to, to address their concerns. Thank you. Okay, this one, um, Chief, is going to be directly to you. We all know that over the past last couple of years, Durham law enforcement has not had the support of the majority of city council members when it comes to the budget and staffing issues. With that being said, Chief, how will you be able to tackle Durham's growing crime epidemic and how can the community help, the, help in the process? And does DPD still have the citizens on patrol program? Well, you know, I, I am fortunate to be working with a tremendous um, group of law enforcement professionals that are very knowledgeable with, with, their, with, their, um, with their job, uh, their career. They, uh, they know a lot. And certainly um, they entered into this profession because that they understand that this was their calling. So, you know, the, the support or lack of support does not have bearing um, on the mission that we that we do every day. Um, and so I would say this, that what we know is, is violent crime and, and the reduction of violent crime 
is really dependent upon a few things. It's community engagement, um, which as you've seen tonight, even with you know, our staffing, we are still out there engaging with, with our residents and our community as a whole in various aspects. Um, it's also with focused um, and very purposeful enforcement strategies, right? So the idea is that you want to be strategic in your enforcement because when you just go out there and just enforce without a plan or uh, a direction or a purpose, um, you, that's when you get into um, over policing, right? Um, and then finally, we want to also focus on prevention and intervention. So what is causing the crime? We know people are not born committing crime, right? There's most of the time, there's something that has happened in their life that has caused this. There is a circumstance or a situation. Um, and I feel, you know, wholeheartedly that we must, you know, we must continue to invest in community-based programs. And that is the city as a whole, right? Um, we also provide those programs here within the Durham Police Department because we do, uh, we do believe in that we can have, we can have enforcement and good professional policing as well as community-based partnership um, with law enforcement that can be effective. And finally, I think the COP, I think they are on hold because of COVID, um, but we are starting to kind of get that plan together on how to bring them back and do some uh, program review to maybe revitalize them a little bit. So thank you, that was a great question. Not sure who asked it, but thank you. Thank you for that. And the next will be, about shootings near convenience stores. Are there specific strategies um, taking place throughout the law enforcement when those shootings occur? And do you see a pattern um, near the local convenience stores? I, I, I would say that we have not noticed a pattern near convenience stores. Um, Certainly we have not tied any of the shootings into or relating them to convenience stores. So um, we, we have not seen a, anything that would stick out as a pattern for, for us. Share for kid. Do the DA office, judges, police, sheriff office meet to address gun violence? The short answer is yes. Uh, manager Wanda Page, city manager Wanda Page has convened the Violent Crime Reduction uh, Task Force Roundtable and we meet uh, monthly and we been meeting for a long time, for years, um, uh, but she's continued that conversation. So we do share information, uh, discuss strategies and talk about uh, how we can do our jobs and, and how we can work with the DA's office for successful prosecution. So those meetings are ongoing and, and now we certainly welcome Chief Andrews into those meetings as well. With your mention, you chief, would you like to address that some? No, I would just say ditto. I mean, I you know we, we had a very productive um, meeting uh, this week, and um, they are helpful to bring all of us together. And it also incorporates you know some of our partners that that are not necessarily tied into law enforcement. It's a holistic approach that the city and the county are are invested in, um, and it's refreshing. And it actually kind of leads and is a good segue into the next question. Um, and I will say for audience purposes, I will only be asking a few more questions, but please note that the chat is being copied. So this continue, um, this conversation can continue again within the pact um, at their regularly scheduled meeting. So the next question goes into Given the everyday violence seen in Durham today, how is it justifiable to be replacing police officers with social workers 
and Chief Andrews, are you comfortable with the city council reducing the number of officers in your department? So this is what I will say is that what we do know is that law enforcement officers we respond to calls. We are trained to respond to calls with people in crisis. However, we don't have the full cadre, the full tool belt, if you will, in order to properly address and provide services after the call. And I think that we can all agree on that. Um, so I certainly, um, you know, I certainly am supportive of an initiative that can help us. Um, do that. You know, I think I've heard time and time again that, you know, law enforcement officers should not be responding to calls. And while I would agree with that, I also recognize that, you know, we do have to be open to, to, to trying other alternative methods um, of addressing community issues. And sometimes the police are just not equipped to be able to do that. And we have some highly trained officers that are trained in crisis intervention, right? But, but we do need more. And so certainly I'm supportive um, of solutions um, we will be um, great partners to the community safety department because we do want it to succeed. Uh, and, and that is, that is our, my vision and that's, that is kind of our stance on that. Sheriff, I would not like to count you out of this question if you would like to add anything or say anything to that. Well, I would just echo what the chief has said. The, the city has launched uh, this initiative and uh, the chief is correct. We should be looking at various models. Uh, I've long advocated for a co-responder model. Uh, I've talked to my colleagues from Colorado to New Mexico to, to New York. We, law enforcement, should not be responding to all of these calls, but we certainly don't want to put clinicians and social workers in harm's way. Uh, so I'm going to continue to advocate for the co-responder model it's going to take all of us. It's not one versus the other. You can't replace or reduce law enforcement services and shore up social services. I think you need to do both. And uh, I'm committed to working with uh, the city of Durham and, and their, all of their agencies and departments that are looking at ways to ensure that we have a proper police response and, and from uh, law enforcement, from the sheriff's office, but also we need to address the mental health concerns and the mental health issues that are, that are uh, plaguing our city. And we haven't talked about mental health tonight, but I think the number is some close to 28, 29% of the calls we respond to have a mental health component. Uh, we're not mental health practitioners. But when someone is in crisis, their behavior is unpredictable. So we want to make sure that they get the help they need, but we also want to make sure we keep our clinicians and social service workers safe as well. So again, that's why I advocate for the co-responder model. Thank you both. And I will say um, this will be the last question this evening. How are we doing within Durham about confiscating guns um, in our community? Yeah, so we are confiscating guns. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Um, this year we have confiscated about 600 guns. I think it's 561. Um, it's, it's actually an increase um, from the number of guns that we have seized and confiscated last year. So we are, we are we are confiscating guns, um, but you know, for every five or five hundred and sixty-one guns there are out there that we confiscate, there are more coming in. As you know, the sheriff, uh, you know, Sheriff Burkhead alluded to. I mean, you know, they're making their own guns now, and so that's dangerous because oftentimes they don't come with they don't come with serial numbers. They're they're the traceability uh, for them is is um, is significantly lower. Uh, but that's, we are confiscating those, those firearms. 
Uh, yeah, we've, we've confiscated over 125 guns. Uh, it's almost every stop that we make, uh, there's a gun involved uh, and they're, they're drugs or there's alcohol. And so, yes, the short answer is yes. We And we will continue to target guns because of the gun violence that we are experiencing. And that's why it's, it's, it's really important that it's not just the Durham Police Department, it's not just the Sheriff's Office, we are clearly working with our federal partners because they have some resources that we cannot bring to bear and they have been so kind in working with us. And uh, so we're trying to slow the guns coming into our community uh, and, and prosecute the individuals who are responsible for the violence and, and really get these guns out of, out of our community. Uh, I had a young man, teenager, 13, uh, last week, we had a conversation with him because he posted on his Instagram uh, the weapon, and he the weapon has changed two or three times, hands two or three times within his circle, and his mother brought him in for a conversation, uh, and he was telling us, you know, he can get, I can take this gun, he can get another one, uh, just like just like that. So we, we've got to address that, and we will continue to address it. Thank you. Thank you for um, highlighting that um, because that is the again one of the biggest points for this conversation is to show it takes community, and so it may not be easy for a parent to say I need to you know address this issue with my child. But um, thank you for giving that example, just to maybe encourage some parents or other family members to make that step. Um, that's very much appreciated. And at this moment, I will say thank you all for joining us this evening once again. And if anyone do, in our audience is um, wondering about how they can see some of these questions, revisit it, or maybe share with others, they can do so by going on the Durham County community, I'm sorry, the city of Durham community engagement Facebook page. And I believe we can also make it available amongst the different um, packs with the facilitators. And again, this is just the start of this conversation. Um, I can attest to we in District 1, we have had um, Sheriff Burkhead come into our meetings and some other packs have had um, the DA and different um, members of the community um, come into their packs also. So please do not let this evening be the ending part of this conversation. If we're especially going to work to have a stronger and safer Durham, it takes all of us. I cannot stress that enough. So with that being said, this comes to a conclusion. Please visit the Durham um, Community Engagement.org backslash PAC groups for information on your PACs. And if you have questions about uh, what district you might reside in, I believe the website can also do that if you just put in your address and different things of that um, nature. I also challenge everyone that is a listening ear this evening to get involved in your community. Um, don't just wait to a Zoom or in person or however I know some are more comfortable with other settings, but there are multiple, multiple ways to get involved in your community. And I would say just to name a few by, again, attending the PAC meetings, um, hopping on your city, count, city council sessions, county commissioner meetings, because they both, for both uh, law enforcement agencies um, are the governing bodies. And those are the spaces that your voices ought to be heard and your questions are to be answered. Um, so we must not only just have um, conversations, but those are ways that you can take action because you can't have, don't just have the conversation without the action to follow. And I, and I strongly encourage that. So thank you all, have a wonderful evening. Happy holidays, however you choose to name that and word that. <laughs>